today. Amen. Amen. Help me for just a moment, Brother Armstrong. Uh, I, I agree with Sister Ashley. We're a little flat today. So if you could just grab your neighbor and help them to their feet. Amen. And let's just give God some praise this morning. Just, just, just pretend you're a Pentecostal or apostolic church for about two minutes and just, just give God some praise this morning. Because when I think about everything I've been through, when I think about how God has watched over me, when I think about how he woke me up this morning, when I think about how he kept food on my table, money in my pocket this past week, when the ambulance didn't come to my house, when I wasn't stretched out at Latimer's funeral home, I come in here to give God some praise this morning. Oh, come on, look at somebody and say, I came in here to give him some praise. Look at somebody and say, it could have been me, but God, it should have been me. But God, I deserved it, but God. Now somebody give me a but God praise real quick. Oh, come on, I said give me a but God praise real quick. If you know that God stepped in your situation in the past week, come on, give him a praise and a holler right now. Amen, amen. He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Look down your row and say, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. He's worthy, amen. I know it's been a long two weeks. We've had three or four funerals. We've had three or four outside engagements, but God is still good, amen, amen. He's still good. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, verses 5 through 17. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. Verses 5 through 17. And I don't know about you, but I'm excited about worship today because I just felt like God was going to give a word to someone that thought it was all over in their life, in their situation. But God's going to tell you it's not over yet. Amen. Acts chapter 12, verses 5 through 17. If you have it, say amen. I'll be reading to you from the New King James Version. Peter was therefore kept in prison. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Let me read that one more time. But Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals, and so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. Watch what prayer does. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to an iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. Watch this. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. But she began shouting, oh, I'm sorry, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. You've lost your mind, girl. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. They thought he was dead. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, 
he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison and he said go tell these things to James and to the brethren and he departed and went to another place I want to preach just for a few moments this morning it's not over yet look at someone as you go to your seat and say neighbor they think it's over for you they think you're about to die but God gave an alternative word today and he said it's not over yet everybody in here that believes it's not over yet in your situation just give God a radical praise this morning <laughs> Heavenly Father we thank you for this word we thank you for what you're about to do in our midst we thank you for this fresh revelation and fresh oil today that's going to give us a ream of word to let us know it's not over yet Lord we pray that you would touch someone that is not saved someone that needs a church home Lord, I pray that you stir up the gift and the anointing within me. Use me in your service. Lord, we're not here for spectator sport. We're not here for a eulogy. But we come here to praise the living God. So, Lord, we pray that as your word goes forth, that the redeemed of the Lord would say so. In the mighty name of Jesus, let everyone say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. The text today centers upon the historical figure of Peter and his encounter with affliction and bondage. This is interesting for us today because many times we're tempted to have a pity party, to feel sorry for ourselves, to wallow in depression just because we are going through something. Someone talked about us. Someone didn't like our apple pie, someone didn't call our name, someone didn't pat us on the back and now we can't worship, we can't live, we can't function. But here we see Peter, someone that walked with Jesus, that is finding himself struggling with affliction and bondage. As a matter of fact, he's in jail, he's in the hoose gal, he's in the pokey, he has chains upon him. The Bible says that he had two soldiers on both sides of him and he had chains on his body. Peter was an unlikely figure to end up in bonds because this was Peter. This was Petros, the rock. Peter, the individual whose faith declaration would become the foundation for the New Testament church, now finds himself in bonds, now finds himself in jail. How peculiar it is to our paradigms of thinking to see such a historical and theological figure such as Peter in jail. It doesn't seem like it goes together. Someone that is a suffering servant, someone that is holy, someone that is spirit-filled in a jail situation. But many of us can give a testimony today that no matter how much we do for God, we are not immune from trials, sufferings, and calamities in our lives. As a matter of fact, if some of us would give our resume today, it would be littered with things that we went through that we did not expect to go through. But somebody ought to have a praise in their mouth today because even though you went through some things while you were serving and while you were worshiping and while you were praying and while you were lifting up God, God allowed you to survive what you went through. I feel like preacher if I had just a few folks to help me this morning. Yes, yes, all of us can say we didn't think that we would end up in some situations, but aren't you glad today that God didn't leave you in what you were in, but he made a way for you to get out of what you were in and what you did not understand is that while you were in it you were not by yourself but God had his hand upon you and he was guiding you and lifting you out that's a shouting moment if you missed it he had his hand upon you and he was lifting you out while you were in what you did not expect to be in and that's why every now and then you ought to have a remunerating experience and look back over your life and say my God I just have to praise you because you brought me out of something that I could not get myself out of look down your row and say holla 
someone that was called by and walked with Jesus witnessed the miracles of the Messiah firsthand establishing in the New Testament church should not find himself in jail. This was Peter, the one that witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus. Peter, the one that walked on the water. Peter, the one that preached on the day of Pentecost is now in jail. As I declared, Peter was an unlikely candidate to end up in bonds. Peter, within the historical context of the scripture, was the most important figure within the new religious movement that was emerging as Christianity. Peter, this former fisherman, was now the center of church history. Isn't it strange, my friends, how God raises up seemingly insignificant figures and makes them significant in the kingdom? Many would have diminished the relevancy of Peter's existence, but now we see him as a sign and a symbol of God's delivering power. Thus, we have to understand and comprehend that sometimes what we go through through is not about us but sometimes what we go through becomes a sign and a symbol to someone else for what God can do that's why I don't lose my mind when I find myself going through some situations because I learned that no matter what stage of life I'm in I always have an audience that's watching me as I'm going through what I'm going through so I trust God enough in my suffering and in my life that I'm willing to go through some things because I understand that sometimes it's not always about me. Somebody ought to say amen. But when I go through something, there's somebody on the peripheral of my life that's watching me go through and they're watching me still praising him. They're watching me still worshiping him. They're watching me still praying to him. They're watching me still pressing my way. So that's why I understand that all things work together for the good of them that love God. So that means that no matter what I'm in right now, that is no indication of what God is going to do in my life. What I'm going through right now is no indication that God has left me or abandoned me, but it means that God's going to take my life and my situation and make it an advertisement for his deliverance, his power, and his glory. Is there anybody in here that can say, Preacher, I sure enough know what you're talking about because my life has been an advertisement for what God can do. If you don't mind, just wave your hand if that's you. I want some sinners in here to understand that God is still on his throne and he will still bring you out look at someone and say don't give up yet on the surface it was an unlikely journey that led many of us to being bound however I want us to know that from our, our, that our predicaments that we face may simply be a setup for what God can do in our lives what we go through might be a setup for God to get some glory in the midst of our situation I have learned in my, my years of kingdom experience that we often go through what we often go through is for the express purpose of God's glory God knows what we can handle so at times his permissive will allows us to end up in an unlikely journey and end up in some unlikely predicaments so that God's glory can be manifested but I don't know about you but I've learned that the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us I understand the words of Job are true even though you slay me yet will I trust in you so it doesn't matter what I go through it's not going to have an impact on my praise and my relationship because I know that God is is still walking with me. Do I have anyone in here that understands that even whether you're up or whether you are down, you know that God is still walking with you. Whether you're laughing or whether you are crying, he is still walking with you. Whether you have money falling out of your pocket or whether you're living from paycheck to paycheck, you understand that God is still walking with you because I understand it's not about how I'm living, but it's because of why I'm living. I understand that I'm living for him and if I'm living for him, he's going to always bring me out of whatever I am in. I wish somebody in here would just give him a quick praise right there because somebody needs to know in here that God will bring you out of what you're in. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged by how things look because God is not through in your life. That ought to place someone's struggle in perspective today. You are going around depressed, defeated, and pessimistic because you think that what you are going through is going to kill you. Rather, I came to declare and confirm that your unlikely struggle or bondage may be a platform for God to take you higher. So stop looking depressed. Stop looking upset. Stop being mad at the world. Stop looking like you got hit with the ugly stick. Baby, put a smile on your face. Lift up your head. Raise your hand to 
God get you a new outfit, get you some new Mac uh, cosmetics, get you some new Issey cologne, buy you some new hair weave and stilettos, uh, and go ahead and celebrate because I came by here to tell you that what you're going through right now is just for a season, but God's going to bless you and take you higher. Somebody ought to shout higher. Somebody ought to say, this is the last time I'm going to be depressed. This is the last time I'm going to be bound. This is the last time I'm going to be frustrated because God just told me this morning that he's not through working in my situation. Yeah, he's not through. So stop being mad at the world. He didn't leave you. Make sure you didn't leave him. You don't have to be frustrated about what happened 40 years ago. Baby, you survived and you still have your right mind. You still have your joy. I know that Negro didn't treat you right, but God brought you out. So you might as well holler and praise him while you have a chance. You mad about what happened in your life in 1975 and Miss Latimer ain't picked you up yet? You ought to be praising them like you lost your mind. They in the ground and you still mad. Baby, come on, get a grip. God brought you out and you look good when you came out. So you might as well praise him. I come to proclaim life this morning. Uh-huh. I come to proclaim liberation and destiny in someone's life. I want you to understand that just because you are in the midst of a thing, it's not over yet. Just because you have storm winds and clouds all around you, it's not over yet. Just because you don't know how to pay your bills on Monday or Tuesday this week, it's not over yet. Even though the heathen are raging in your life, it's not over yet. I wish I had just about a hundred folk in here that could hold a conversation with themselves this morning. I promise you, I won't call you schizophrenic. I won't say you have a wellness issue, but I want you to talk to yourself this morning. I want you to tell yourself, I, it's not time to give up because it's not over yet. Come on, talk to yourself. It's not time to be faithless because it's not over yet. It's not time to embrace defeat because God said it's not over yet. It's not time to let your haters celebrate because God said it's not over over yet. It's not time to give the devil the deed to your life because God said it's not over yet. It's not the time to accept the worst in your health situation because God said it's not over yet. It's not the time or season to downsize or downgrade in your life because God said it's not over yet. It's not time to abandon your praise because God said it's not over yet. It's not time to forfeit your faith because God said it's not over yet. I need somebody in here to just jump to your feet and say it's not over yeah I'm gonna wake y'all up this morning if it kills me trying it amen it's not over pat yourself on the chest and say I'm coming out the Lord's about to give me an overflow he's about to open the windows of heaven for me pat yourself on the chest and say I'm not the I'm not the tail I am the head I'm blessed in the city I'm blessed in the field the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he is bringing me out nudge your neighbor and say yes he is yes he is you see I learned that sometimes you just got to encourage yourself I don't need to praise team the preachers or the deacons to get me happy. All I got to do is look in the mirror and see I'm still here. And that's enough for me to praise and holler like I lost my mind because I know that God brought me through some stuff I shouldn't have been brought through. But isn't he worthy to be praised? Tell somebody, I see your future. I feel your faith. I agree with your favor. And it's not over yet. Look here, Peter. Look here, Peter. Let, let, me, let me be theological just for about five minutes. We're going to get out of here because I'm going to bonefish grill today. Amen. Peter was facing imminent annihilation. Yet God was in the process of saying, it's not over yet. 
within the historical context of the scripture, we must understand this is a dire time in church history. The leaders of this new faith, this Jesus movement, find themselves under persecution. The one who was facilitating the persecution upon the church and his leaders was a man by the name of Herod, particularly Herod Agrippa. He was the son of Aristobulus, son of Herod the Great, the nephew of Herod Antipas, who killed John the Baptist and the brother of Herodias, the pastor studies. Herod Agrippa felt it was his duty to call to persecute the church and stifle the social and religious movement which he viewed as a threat to his empire. Preceding the arrest of Peter, Herod Agrippa made the apostle James the first apostolic a martyr. He killed him by the sword and made him an example. Now here is Peter waiting for the same fate. Everyone in the community is waiting for him to die. A horrible death. Peter he was bound in chains between two guards waiting to be killed by the sword which was viewed as a disgraceful way to die even beyond the cross at this particular time in culture. Peter was held in extraordinary conditions. He was bound in chains attached to two soldiers while two other soldiers watched him while he was bound. Watch this. He was surrounded by two soldiers. He was bound in chains, bound to them in chains, and there was two other soldiers outside the door watching to make sure he did not escape. I feel like preaching right there. But God. That's a preaching moment right there. It doesn't matter how the devil tries to bind you up. Somebody say preach, Mac. It doesn't matter what's holding you down or holding you back. When God decides to set you free, baby, you will be free indeed. That's why you ought not ever give up in any situation. Let me say it one more time. He had two soldiers on each side. He was bound in chains to the soldiers. He had two more soldiers outside the door to make sure he did not escape. But watch what God does in his situation. They were waiting on him to die. However, in the midst of his bondage, some things occurred that moved the heart of God. I am convinced the reason why some of us stay in prolonged bondage or never get delivered is because we are going through a thing and nothing ever happens on our part to move the heart of God. We just sit there so lethargic and so defeated and we just say, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. No, you have to come against some things with the authority of Jesus. Oh, come on, let, let me have a baptistolic moment. You have to come against some things in the name of Jesus. I don't care if I'm broke, I'm going to pray that money's going to come in my life. I don't care if I'm sick, I'm going to pray, I'm going to get well. I'm going to say in the name of Jesus, I'm going to get the job. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to get the promotion. In the name of Jesus, my mind is going to be regulated. In the name of Jesus, my children are going to be well. In the name of Jesus, my marriage is going to be fixed. In the name of Jesus, my church is going to prosper. Is there anybody in here that's ever had to take a 40 over situation and say, not today, it's not going down like this because my faith is telling me that the Lord is up to something in my life. I wish I had about 30 prayer warriors in here. I wish I had some prayer meeting folks in here that you've looked at your situation and you've prayed in the name of Jesus and you saw something turn and shift in your life and what you thought was going to happen did not happen. You got to move the heart of God. You sitting there looking pitiful and pathetic. You ought to be praying and praising. Let me say that one more time. You sitting there looking pitiful and pathetic. You ought to be praying and praising. Uh, that, that's, that's the point when you touch your dead neighbor and say, Reverend's trying to preach to you this morning. Amen. Put some joy on your face because it's about to turn around. Put some hope in your spirit because it's about to turn around. Go home a different way because God's about to move in your situation. Go in your job on Tuesday morning and look at that person that can't stand you and say, I love you in the name of Jesus. I wish I had somebody, somebody, somebody that could say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. I, I thought I was in a Baptist church this morning. Let, let me help and get out of here because Cheney needs to celebrate his anniversary. The key factors that led God to saying it's not over yet too. Here, here, let me give you some quick things and I'm, I promise I'm out of here. The believers were in consistent warfare. Peter had enough sense 
to connect himself with some people that knew how to engage in spiritual warfare. They, they, they were different than the postmodern church. Let Mac Reynolds go, end up in jail. They're going to be calling meetings and committees going to be meeting, at, not at the church, but they're going to meet at the diner and they're going to figure out what to do when they get here. Amen. Trying to, I, I told y'all, y'all should have watched him, but look here, Peter's in jail, but the church is praying for him. Peter's in trouble and they're not talking about him. But they're, they're in a house having a prayer meeting. Saying, Lord, you got to get our apostle out. Lord, you got to help our pastor. Lord, you got to get the man of God out of his situation. You see, watch this. The reason why some never get delivered from their bondage is because they are connected to people that don't know how to spiritually fight for them. That's why I don't need everyone in my atmosphere or my entourage, but I need folks around me that I know that will pray for me when my back is between a rock and a hard place. I need some folks that will get down on their knees and fast and pray that I will get a blessing when I need a blessing. I need some folks in my leadership that won't try to tear me down but will try to lift me up and say I'm you got license to go home and go through your cell phone and purge and delete some names and if those folks in your phone won't pray for you then they need to get the heck out of your atmosphere he's in jail and they pray <laughs> when we are struggling around bondage it doesn't do us any good to be connected to people that add toxic words and spirits to our situations. When I'm in trouble, I don't need any more negativity or toxicity. I know I'm in trouble. But I need somebody that's going to stir my faith. I need somebody that's going to help lift me higher. Do I have any witnesses in here? Is there anybody that's been going through a situation and you just want somebody to walk up to you and say, girl, say, girl, I'm praying for you. You don't want somebody to say, what happened? Who did it? No, you want somebody to say, in the name of Jesus, I, I want you to be encouraged. Leave those negative folks at the barber shop, the beauty shop, the corner store, or put them out of the house. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Secondly, let me cut across the field. Cheney's still giving me that look. He want to go home for his anniversary. <laughs> Secondly, they exercise the power of prayer. Postmodern culture believes that prayer is sometimes insignificant. In teaching my class a few years ago in the National Baptist Convention, I said, if you look at the participation in the average African American Baptist church, one of the ministries that has one of the lowest participations in the, in the church based upon its size percentage is prayer meeting. If I want to slip something in on the church, I'd do it in prayer meeting. But we have to understand that prayer still works. I said prayer still works. I said prayer still works. Y'all didn't hear, is the microphone on? I said prayer still works. However, the social context of the scripture speaks to us and declares that prayer really does work. While Peter was bound, they were praying. While Peter was oppressed, they were praying. While their enemies were rejoicing, they were in prayer. While some would have given up, they were in prayer. Watch this. When you look at the text in the scripture, they weren't out there arguing with the enemies. They weren't pleading to Herod to let him out, but they just went in the room and they began to pray. You see, sometimes you give folks and stuff too much of your time and your attention, worrying about things and worrying about people. You need to just go in your room and pray and say, Lord, I need you to stay, take over and move in my situation. It was Walter Mueller that stated, prayer is not an occasional impulse to which we respond when we are in trouble, but prayer is a life attitude. Prayer ought to be a part of your life attitude. You ought to wake up praying. My wife says, I snore. No, I'm not snoring. I'm praying in my sleep. <laughs> Lord, she don't know what a prayer is. Amen. She think I'm snoring. I'm, I'm, I'm hooping in my sleep. <sighs> Lord, I'm praying. <laughs> prayer 
there needs to be a life attitude. Because if you only pray when you are in trouble, then your prayer is cheap and counterfeit. But you need to learn to pray on a daily basis. You need to say, Lord, I need you to lead me on this journey. Lord, you are my help. You need to pray on a regular basis. It is written in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. It says, pray without ceasing. So that means your lifestyle, your mindset has to be shifted and transformed to where you pray even when you're driving down the street. You're always in a state of meditation. When you're sitting there eating your cornflakes in the morning, you're praying while you're crunching your cornflakes. You're praying while you're in the shower. You're praying on your knees. Every time, even when you're watching the news, you slip in some prayers and saying, Lord, I need you to move in my situation. Every time we stop praying to complain about our situation, we are slowing the process of divine intervention. We are taking away from the movement and the activity of God when we stop praying and commuting with, communicating with God about what we're going through and we take time to fret and complain. Regardless of the problem, we don't have time to stress or complain. We need to pray. We need to pray without ceasing regarding our families. Pray without ceasing regarding our children. Pray without ceasing regarding our battles. Uh, pray without ceasing regarding our bodies. Uh, I told Brother Thomas this morning, I said, I don't know how I'm losing weight. I went to the doctor uh, this past week for my sleep study because she said I'm snoring, amen, and I lost five more pounds, uh, and I'm eating like a horse, amen, but that's what prayer will do. Uh, you can eat and still lose weight. Somebody shout hallelujah for the pastor. We must avoid the temptation of living prayerless lives. The adversary will make us think that we must advocate for ourselves and ignore the power and potential of prayer. That's why I don't lift my hand in battle. That's why I don't lose my mind over my enemies. That's why I don't let anything cause me to lose sleep that's going on in my life because I know if I pray and I give it to the Lord and leave it right there, the Lord knows how to fix it. He knows how to handle it. So I don't have to lose my cool and lose my mind and get all stressed out and look all crazy, get bags on my eyes and get all crazy looking because I know that God is working in my situation. Is there anybody in here that can say, I trust God with my situation. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to lose my mind. I'm not going to let the devil see me go crazy, but I'm just going to lay it at the altar of the Lord, and I'm going to believe that the Lord will work out my situation. Do I have anybody that will help me get out of here this morning? So I just stopped by here to tell you this morning that no matter what you're going through, don't stop praying about it. Don't stop seeking God about it because if you just keep on praying the Lord will work out your situation look at this text comes alive the Bible says that Peter was in a prison he was bound in all these chains like I described to you but here were the saints of God they were at a house of Rhoda Rhoda's house and they were praying I don't know what kind of prayers they were doing maybe some were singing and some were praying maybe they were praying all together and maybe they were praying one at a time but one thing we cannot escape is that somebody in the church was praying for somebody's situation that's why we ought to lift each other up in prayer because you don't know what your neighbor is going through you don't know what a marriage is going through you don't know what a young person is going through you don't know what the musicians or the preachers are going through so you ought to always pray for somebody because the text lets us know here that when we pray that something happens somebody say it will happen when we pray God will step in our situation. So we see here as the text unfolds that as they were praying, that simultaneously as they were praying, that God unleashed some angels and they went to the jail and the Bible says that a light shone upon Peter that woke him up from his slumber and his sleep. And here's the miraculous thing. The Bible says that he was chained to two guards, but the guards never moved. There's no evidence that they were ever awakened. So that just shows us that when God wants to bless you. He can maneuver through whatever he needs to maneuver through to get your attention and to get you out. Is there anybody in here that can say, I know what you're talking about because the Lord went through some valleys. He went over some mountains. He went through some folks in order to bless me and bring me out. The Bible says that the angel said to him, Peter, awake. Arise up from your situation. In other words, he was saying, you're no longer bound, but this 
is your day of freedom. This is your day of liberation. It's not over yet. I know, Peter, you thought that you were going to be dead, but God had another plan for your life. Shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, it's not over yet. God has a plan for your life. Look at somebody and say, hold up your head. Come on, we're getting out of here. Say, raise up your praise. Lift up your worship because God is saying it's not over yet. The Bible says that the light shone upon Peter and that the chains began to fall off and the prison doors open. I don't know what happened to those four guards, but all I know is that the words of David must have been true when he said, I will make your enemies your footstool because when God decided to bless him, those four guards could not touch him. They could not hold him. They could not contain him. And as a matter of fact, if you really exegete the text, it was no evidence uh, that they even saw his deliverance uh, until after it happened. Uh, that's why I like the way God moves uh, because sometimes after he blesses me I just like to look behind me and see what my enemies have to say. Uh, sometimes after he blesses me I like to look back behind me and see what the devil is doing. Uh, sometimes after he set me free uh, I have to look back at what used to have me bound uh, and the Bible said uh, the prison doors opened and he got out of the jail and it said that one door opened on his own and Peter said I must be dreaming because God has been so good could I really be out of jail could I really be out of this predicament can God really be that good but then when he found himself outside of the jail when he found himself down the street and around the corner he must have looked around and had a baptistolic moment and gave God a Jermaine Johnson shout he must have said, God is so good. He brought me out of my situation. And then watch how this happens. God ordered his steps back to the very place of where people were praying for him. And Peter goes to the house. He knocks on the door and the lady comes to the door and she hears his voice. The Bible doesn't say what he's saying, but it says she heard his voice. You know, it's not normal for somebody to come knock on your door and just start talking. Usually you wait for somebody to say hello, but the Bible says she heard the voice of Peter. So if I can use some speculative theology with my doctoral degree, I, miss, I believe that he must have been knocking on the door saying, thank you, Jesus. Jesus. He must have been knocking on the door and saying, God, you are good. He must have been knocking on the door and saying, Lord, you did it again. He must have been knocking on the door and said, nothing can stop me. He must have been knocking on the door and said, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And the Bible says, she heard his voice. She heard his praise. She heard his testimony. And she ran back to the ladies without even opening the door. And she said, it's Peter at the door. And the Bible says that they said, girl, you're beside yourself. You done lost your mind. He's in there in prison. He's in chains. He's in bars. But she said, no, it's Peter at the door. And somebody must have got frustrated. I'm going to show you how crazy she is. And they must have walked to the door. I'm going to show you that's not Peter. And they opened the door. The one that was praying opened the door and she saw Peter. And I I believe she must have started shouting too because the Bible says that when they came into the house that they were astonished and he had to quiet them down. So I believe a spontaneous praise broke out over what the Lord had done. So can I close it out right here? When we think about the goodness of Jesus and everything he's done for us, is there anybody, anybody in here that can break out in a spontaneous praise because of what the Lord has done? The Bible says that everything that hath breath, praise ye the Lord. Shake your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, you have reason to praise him. Shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, you ought to praise him right now. Shake somebody's hand and say, look at what the Lord has done. Shake somebody's hand and say, he's worthy. I said, he's worthy. Somebody that was bound but is now free. 
ought to give God a ridiculous praise if he did the improbable in your life. You ought to give him a ridiculous praise if he moved in your situation. Give him some praise. Hold on, watch this, watch this. Give me, give me 10 seconds, Don. I want you to jump right back there. Some of y'all don't, don't get it. Hey, if, you're not, if you're not ashamed of where the Lord brought you from, this is where I need all the ex-club folk. All the ex-club folk. Don't, don't y'all look at me so religious and sedentary. We, we, can, we can cut the cameras off so folks won't see you. But this is where I need all the ex-club folk to teach folk like me that don't have rhythm, don't know how to move. Grab somebody and show them, say, baby, this is how you praise him. This is how you move. This is how you exalt his name. Come on, give him a praise right now. Give him a high praise. If you're sitting next to somebody that's not physically able to move, you ought to shout for them. Think about that club that you was at. Maybe last night, maybe five years ago, maybe back in 1975. I want you to dance and praise God like the Temptations were singing to you. If like Michael Jackson was singing to you, or if like Drake is singing to you. Praise God, come on, let's give it to him right now. Give him praise. much of a dancer, but a couple weeks ago I did something I ain't never done before ever in my life. I danced before you all, and honestly I feel like dancing right now, because God continues to bless my life, and he continues to bless your life, so give God the biggest shout, the biggest praise that you can ever give God. Come on right now, give God that praise. Stop your feet. He saved your house. He saved your job. He saved marriages. He healed you. Yes. You want favor, right? You want blessings, right? This is a lifestyle. It's worship and praise. It's a lifestyle. Yes. Some of us may be looking around and saying, what is going on? <laughs> All you can do is laugh and say, you know what? You don't know what God did to me. <laughs> I had a negative $20 in my account. But God today put so much overflow in my account that all you can say is, let me buy you dinner tonight. Woo! You know it's the truth. Yes. Now let me just tell you this. If you don't understand why we're dancing, if you don't understand the, the purpose of our praise and worship, if you don't know who God is, 
if you don't know what the blood of Christ can do for you. But more importantly, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you need to come down right now. I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this has nothing to do with age. This has nothing to do with where you come from. If you don't give yourself to Christ, your life is going to be in shambles until you let God come into your life and let him do what he do best. And that, that you can become more than a conqueror, that you can become a believer, that God can bring blessings and favor into your life. So now I need everybody to look around the church, look around and ask somebody, are you saved? No, 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 this ain't good. I need you to ask somebody with conviction and authority, are you saved? Do you know who Jesus Christ is? Do you have the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you walking in your authority? Now, if you don't know Christ, come on down right now. This is your opportunity to start a whole new life. The deacons are here to receive you. Somebody walk somebody down. This is your time to get a new life. Somebody's looking for Christ. This is your time. This is your opportunity. Yes. This is your time right now to give yourself to Christ. Yes. If you don't know who God is, if you don't know what the Holy Spirit can do for you, we're requesting you to give him a try. You're looking at a whole bunch of club goers. Everybody in this church been to a club once before. If it was down in Mississippi on the banks, if it was in the backwoods of Georgia, if it was in the city life of Atlanta, you've been in the club. But guess what? You're looking at people who have not given up on the club. They just changed the address of their club. And the address of their club is Jesus Christ. The best club you can ever ask for. Yeah, we got a bar. We got a bar. Yes, we do. Holy Spirit. That's what we serve in happy hour all day long. We are living the happy hour all day long. Mr. Floyd, you know what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Keep your head down. He know. Because this is your opportunity to give yourself to Christ. As the choir give us a selection, this is your opportunity to come on down. He will give you a brand new life. He will give you brand new life. Life more abundantly. Oh, come. Say one more time. This is your opportunity.
us say the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We're grateful for you coming and participating in our worship experience today. Uh, I want to do something just a little different as we dismiss in prayer. Uh, Sister Fortune, come down. This is her last Sunday. And Sister Carrington, is she here today? Is she here? Where? Okay, yeah, come down. Yeah. These, these two folks that are uh, I hate to lose. I don't. I still don't think they got deacon approval on moving. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We want to pray for them. We want to uh, lift them up. Amen. As they they relocate, I I have folks in New York City. Sister uh, Fortune. Amen. Sister Carrington. We got folks in Mississippi. You going to Brandon, Mississippi? That's right down I twenty from Meridian about six exits from Meridian, about 70 so miles, amen. Our cousin, my wife's cousin, pastors in Meridian, Fifth Street Baptist Church, state president, Mississippi Baptist Convention. If you have a Meridian, you look him up, tell him the princess said, give you some money, some chicken, take care of you, amen. <laughs> amen, but we wanna pray for you all. We're gonna miss you all at the Eden Missionary Baptist Church. Y'all been very valuable and impactful members here, and we just thank God for you. Y'all wanna say something? Church, I just love you all. Since that time that I first came here, I just felt the warmth and the love, and I stayed. As you know, I'm here every Sunday. I just get my blessings, and God has just blessed me tremendously. I wish I could take each and every one of you with me, but you have an open invitation. <laughs> Please come. change your mind, I'll send the deacons and trustees to what a U-Haul bring you back. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let us just bow our heads all over the sanctuary. We want to pray for them as they relocate. Pray for our church family. Pray for Minister Johnson and his family. Come on, Jermaine, you come down here too. Amen. Amen. We pray over you. Matter of fact, why don't we just all just come to the altar. We'll just dismiss in an altar prayer. Just everyone that can. Just let's just surround these three individuals and we'll just close out in prayer that way. Amen. Amen. We learned today that prayer works and God moves in prayer. Amen. So, amen. 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 Isn't it good just to have a church family? Amen. It's, it's good to have a church family, not just be a, a member at a church, but to have a church family that loves you, that prays for you. That's something great we have here at Enon, and we'll never, we can never lose that. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you for all that you have done today. Lord, we come first asking that you would cover the lives of Sister Carrington and Sister Fortune. Watch over them, Lord, as they relocate, as they go to their new places of uh, living. We pray, God, that you'd plant them in a church home there. We pray, God, that you'd give them a, a faithful pastoral covering that would nurture their lives, that would teach them and feed them the word of God. Lord, we pray for Reverend Johnson and his family and the loss of his younger sister. We pray, God, that you would just allow your, your spirit to dwell with that family in this time of loss. Lord, we thank you for the word that came forth today. We thank you for our children that sang, that led praise and worship, that led the songs of Zion. We thank you for Reverend Armstrong, Lord, that works faithfully along with Sister Maddie and Sister Angela, work with our young people. Uh, Sister By Byfield, we thank God for everyone that pours into the young people of this church, God. We pray that you bless them for their faithfulness. And Lord, I pray that this word has touched someone's life today, that it's transformed someone's situation, that we will be able to walk by faith and not by sight. 
Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the most high God of exceeding joy is the power, the glory, and dominion now henceforth and forevermore that all of God's people say together, Amen. Amen. God bless you.